The memoir itself started out uh, with rather humble beginnings. It was uh, essentially a love letter to my grandparents, both sides of my uh, family, um, for the strength that they um, somehow found in uh, what certainly is some of the most injurious years in Canadian history. And it evolved into something much more personal than I anticipated. I think when you walk beside forgiveness for as long as it takes to write a book, that concept can't help but wash across your own shores and make you think about it from a very personal perspective. So while the, the memoir certainly remains a love letter to these two pillars in my life, my grandma Mitsue Sakamoto and my grandfather Ralph Augustus McLean, um, it also really delved into uh, my own um, struggle with forgiveness uh, in my own immediate family, uh, particularly with, uh, with the passing of my mother. So it, um, it, it evolved into a place that um, I was actually quite surprised at. I'll start with my grandma Sakamoto. So um, during the Second World War, uh, the, G the Canadian government, uh, as uh, your audience members will, will, will know very well, uh, interned uh, all Japanese Canadians. Uh, they moved, uh, and Canadian citizens um, were all evacuated 100 miles off of the coast. This was done even in light of uh, the Canadian uh, military, RCMP, Navy, uh, all uh, testifying in public, saying uh, the Japanese, there is no Japanese Canadian threat. In fact, most of the evacuation occurred in 43, months after the Battle of Midway in 42. The Battle of Midway completely decimated the Japanese Navy. If the Japanese army was going to invade, uh, they'd have to take rowboats across the Pacific Ocean. So it was clearly a racist uh, policy uh, driven by, I think, mostly economic uh, uh, racism. My grandparents ended up in um, Coaldale on a sugar beet farm. And uh, everything was, was taken from them and their, their, their um, the amount that they received back during that time was minuscule. So while they were allowed to leave uh, Alberta after the war, uh, my grandparents had no means to get back to Vancouver or Steveston. Um, in fact, they stayed in Coaldale for another three and a half years. doing the, So the war just carried on for them. Uh, the war continued almost into the 50s for them. Um, finally, they scrounged up enough money to, uh, to move from Coaldale, uh, but only a couple hundred kilometers down the road uh, to Medicine Hat, where they started farming. And that's where, they, that's where they made their livelihood, and that's where they had their children and, and lived their lives. My grandpa McLean, um, after the war, uh, he was um, captured in Hong Kong spent the entire war as a Japanese POW, came back to, um, he landed in Esquimalt, Victoria, the base uh, in, uh, in BC, went home very briefly to the Magdalen Islands where, where his family was, but there was very little, um, very little there for him. And on the way back, all of the soldiers would get on the train and they'd stop in each city. And uh, of course, uh, um, a lot of a lot of young gals would come out and meet the soldiers, and, and there would generally be a, a, a nice celebration. And it's a stretch to call it a parade, but a nice celebration at each stop. And in Calgary, my grandfather met uh, Phyllis McLean, uh, or Phyllis D. at the time, and um, they started writing letters. And uh, so he he came out. He basically followed his heart out to Calgary, 
met, uh, lived with and married uh, Phyllis, who he met as a soldier coming home. So he stayed in Calgary and raised his family there. The Second World War um, took everything um, away from both sides of my family. It stripped, uh, it stripped all of them bare. Uh, they, they clung to one thing, and it kept them alive. They clung to their dignity. They refused to lose their humanity. Um, so, so it is an interesting story from a historical perspective in the sense that um, huge events in their lives impacted them, but on s it was almost like a mirror image. So Pearl Harbor, for example, uh, you know, my grandpa McLean was in Hong Kong. He'd been there for, at that point, just shy of three weeks. He barely, he hadn't even been on Hong Kong uh, Island. He'd just, he'd been in Kowloon. And that was the start of the war for him, you know. Uh, Pearl Harbor was a, a massive, a part of a massive sweep of Japanese forces that overtook Hong Kong in, in, a, in a matter of a few days. But Pearl Harbor was also really the start of the war on my grandma's side as well. They knew that those forces that they had, um, that had been kept on a leash in BC, there was real racism in BC, um, targeted particularly against uh, Chinese Canadians and Japanese Canadians. But they, I think that there was a real understanding that, that Pearl Harbor would sweep them into the geopolitical events of the world. It would overtake them. I think that they felt that this was, you know, a start of a tsunami that would hit their shores and sweep them away. And that's exactly what happened. I think that their story shapes me even even deeper than as a Canadian. And I, what I mean by that is they would be completely excused if they let that hardship harden their hearts. When I came along, um, both sides of my family had already made that conscious decision not to be marred by that time, not to let those injurious years create more injurious years. They knew that that cycle had to stop. And so I don't know, and that act that happened years before I was born, twice, um, taught me, I mean, I owe everything to that act. I wouldn't exist but for that act. Not like, forget about being Canadian, I wouldn't be a human being. Um, and, and so, so their two stories profoundly impacted my life. Um, and it profoundly impacted the way that I think about Canada. It's, it's a place where the soil is fertile for forgiveness. The soil is fertile for human dignity. And that's, uh, that's what they taught me. They taught me that, you know, it is possible in a place like Canada. Um, what, a, what a gift. Well, I, I think that the biggest issue, I think, is taking, taking, taking race and faith out of it, in a way. It's about recognizing the humanity and 
in all of us. And that's what's critical about forgiveness that I came to learn. Forgiveness, I thought, was transactional. I harmed you, you harmed me. Let's say sorry, let's make amends. Well, that's not, that's a transaction. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is cleansing of one's heart in a profound and truthful manner. It's, it's an act that ensures that your past, no matter how dark, no matter how painful, cannot follow you into, into, you know, tomorrow. And that forgiveness is based not even so much on yourself. It's not rooted in your tomorrow. Both sides of my family decided that they would not pass on the transgressions that were committed against them to their children. And I think that at the end of the day, everybody in this country, every respective faith, the community you belong to, you want your children to have a, a more hopeful tomorrow. You want them to lead productive, healthy, happy, safe lives. That, I think, is the foundation of race relations. That, I think, is the foundation of human relations. Um, so I, th I think that's the lesson that I learned in my story, in my grandparents' story. And I think that that transcends my story and is applicable to speaking about how different communities react and work with each other. I think that there is really only one light um, to the darkness that is racism. I think it's hope. I think that when you look at even beautiful places in the world like Paris, Paris burns every other summer on the outskirts. Why? How is that possible? It's the finest city in the, one of the finest cities in the world. You have a ring around Paris where there have been multi-generations, generation after generation, um, of folks from North Africa or the Middle East that see no hope. They see no hope for their children. And that is always a recipe for disaster. Not only for those children, but for the city itself, for the country, for the world. So I think that the key ingredient in, f in fighting and defeating racism is ensuring that you are cultivating a society in which hope is a reasonable um, emotion to feel in your heart. I feel hopeful for my children. I think that they're going to have access to a great education. I think that they can live long, productive, healthy lives. If I didn't feel that, and I felt structural barriers around that, I would rebel against those structural barriers. I'd fight it with everything that I had. Not for me, but for them. And so I think that is, um, that's the key ingredient. Uh, when you really distill down all of the myriad of things that people point to uh, in, you know, in a, in a, a racist society or, a, or a, a troubled society. I think it really comes down to that one singular word. I'll tell you what doesn't come to mind when I think about multiculturalism in the Canadian context. What doesn't come to mind is the word tolerance. God, I hate that word. It's this, you know, it's this notion that, oh, we, you know, we tolerate things. Well, no, I, I tolerate 
the smell of my garbage until I take it out. That's not, that's not Canadian multiculturalism. And anyone who says that, I think really, really misses the point of what this nation is or could be. When Canada is at its best, and when Canada is at its best, it's actually, you know, one of the only places in the world that actually does this well, I think. And goodness, I'm glad it does. But it celebrates those people, all people. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't say, oh, isn't that nice? They, you know, how, how this group does that and we let them do that. No, it looks at their, what their background means to them. And it finds ways that it means something to everybody else. And it shares that. That's what's stunning about, about this country. We have, you know, Canada is the world. And we see everything. We see all parts of it. And we get to, we get, we're in this blessed situation where we get to not only interact with the world's cultures, but we get to come to know them. And we get to come, we get to experience them. And experience, you know, experience different cultures, other cultures, foods, their traditions, little nuggets of, of wisdom. I read somewhere, I can't remember who wrote this, but I, re I remember reading Geography is Destiny. And I do feel that about Canada. I feel that here is this expansive landscape. It stretches miles and miles. Driving on the Canadian prairies, you just, you can see forever. And that gives you such an expansive feeling. It's a feeling of, you know, that, that expansiveness, I think, can't help but touch your heart. And there's a generosity of spirit, I think, that does in part come from our geography. We're blessed with space. We're blessed with water. We're blessed with this wonderful, these wonderful lands, as diverse as they are. And that allows us, I think, to to celebrate diversity of all, of all sorts and be expansive and generous and hopeful to, to others and to ourselves. So I do think that, you know, there is, this, there is this feeling that we as a people should take care of our brothers and sisters. Universal health care is a great example of, of us saying we should try our best to hang tight here. We should help each other. We should be, we should be as expansive as we can be. Um, we should be, we should be generous. Um, and that's, that's based on, I think, this concept of, of being hopeful for tomorrow. Um, so, so I, I think that, that that feeling in Canada, it's, uh, I can't really distill it down to a word. I apologize for that, but I do think that, that the defining Canadian value is generosity of spirit. And, and boy, if we can hang on to that, that's a pretty great achievement. Well, now you're going to kind of make me put on my lawyer hat, I think. I mean, I love the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I love it because of what took place to my grandparents. I love it as an organizing document for a nation. The world needs more charter. And I love what the Supreme Court justices have done with the charter. They've really embedded this concept of human dignity. 
I mean, look at the biggest cases that face our modern nation through the lens of human dignity. What a fantastic, think of how other countries regulate themselves or are regulated by others. And here we have this institution that sets the laws of the land and has as its operating principle human dignity. So I think that we have, as Canadians, as citizens of this country, we have the, an obligation to elevate human dignity to promote human dignity and make sure that that what we do in our life stimulates human dignity and I think we have a, an obligation to really seek out areas where dignity is clearly in absence and shine a light on those areas and fix it And that is a uh, challenging but wonderful obligation. And I think that when Canada is operating at its best, that's what we're doing at home. And that's what we've done abroad. And I think that that's when we are working together at our finest, we're punching way above our weight in terms of ensuring that human dignity is something that is felt meaningfully here and abroad.